The problem of universals. This problem seems to have originated with our good dead friends, Plato and Aristotle. In philosophy, a universal is something that can be common to many particulars, and it's typically taken to be a property or a quality. For example, Katniss, not the character in Hunger Games, but the property being a cat, is something common to all cats. Green is something common to all green things. Now, intuitively, universals seem to be elements of both speech and thought, because we talk about you know, green. We think about green. So the main problem of the problem of universals is, not surprisingly, determining the metaphysical nature of universals. Now, this can be traced back um, before our good dead friends Plato and Aristotle to, of course, Thales, our good dead friend laying out the problem of the one and the many back, um, you know, in the BC. And as we saw before, way back in the introduction, he lived 624 to 545 BC, and he sought to find the underlying unity of the world. So the problem of the one and the many involves determining the basic principle that accounts for everything. What is the, you know, behind all the things? So we saw Plato's view. So we've already in a way seen the problem of universals in the context of Plato. But let's jump ahead a few centuries to where the problem of universals really got rolling again, which is, of course, during the time of the scholastics. And these were uh, students and teachers in the schools created by Charlemagne uh, back in the way back. And as often happens in philosophy, this a term uh, of scholastics. They were just the students and teachers in Charlemagne schools, which is why we now have the term you know, scholastics and scholars. And later it was applied to a particular philosophical view that involved trying to get faith and reason to be integrated. And they were known as the scholastics, or sometimes called the schoolmen. And during the time of uh, Charlemagne and beyond a bit, scholasticism was a dominant philosophical approach. So much like, you know, fashion and entertainment, there can be fads and dominant views in philosophy. So the scholastics are pretty important because they really uh, focused on this problem of universals. So how did they formulate this problem? So the scholastics approach the problem of universals in the following way. They were influenced by Boethius's translation of Porphyry's introduction to Aristotle's categories. And they focused on three questions. Question one, do universals exist as metaphysical entities or do they exist only in, in the understanding? Let's say, are they real things out in the world or are they purely mental entities? Question two, if universals exist as metaphysical entities, are they material or immaterial? Question three, if universals exist as metaphysical entities, are they separate from the sensible objects or not? Essentially, this is the question of whether universals are Platonic, existing in the Platonic heaven, and in the picture of society of Athens, we see Plato pointing up, because that's where he, metaphorically speaking, puts his universals. Or are they not separable from the sensible objects? Put another way, are the universals here? Are they imminent as opposed to transcendent? And that's Aristotle's view, which is why he's pictured as holding out his hand, um, saying that they're, they're here. Now, when it comes to universals and types and stuff, there's some terminology, uh, again, we've seen this before, but it would be the following key terms. One is type, and it works the same as it does in normal everyday language. This would be a general kind of thing, such as blue, human, or computer. And a token in this context would be a specific individual of a type, such as Sally's you know, blue shirt, uh, George Bush, or 
Steve's um, MacBook. And the problem of universals, generally speaking in this context, in terms of tokens and types, would be this. In virtue of what does a specific token fall under a type? So for example, in virtue of what is George Bush a human? Put more formally with some logic-y stuff, it would be in virtue of what is token A of the type F. Now when it comes to the problem of universals, there are a variety of approaches. One approach, kind of one of the more extreme, in fact one of the two extreme views, is what's called realism. Now philosophically, realism doesn't mean what it means in sort of informal everyday use. When someone talks about they're a realist, they mean that they're very practical. And people often say like they're realists, often when they're gonna do something kind of kind of bad perhaps. But anyways, realism in in the you know the context of everyday use, it typically means the person doesn't have any place for anything abstract or theoretical. Uh, also, in the context of art, it means obviously that people do things in a style that matches, um, you know, the way things things seem to appear. So, what does it mean philosophically? Well, it actually does make pretty good sense. Realism philosophically is the view that whatever you're realist about, you accept it as being well real. So, if you're a realist about universals, that would mean that you believe they're real and they, they exist. Now, realists do differ on their view as to whether these universals exist only in their objects or they can exist separately. For example, um, John Scotus Erigena accepted the Neoplatonic view that forms exist between God and the sensible world. San Anselm seemed to have accepted a Platonic view that the forms are not here, they're in, you know, Platonic hyperspace. Others, such as William of Champeau, 1070 to 1121, argued the universals do not exist apart from individuals. So the same universal exists in different individuals. And what people call them today are imminent universals because they're imminent they're here as opposed to transcendent or platonic universals which are not here they're somewhere else now the scholastics had a epistemic motivation to accept universals now this ar arose from aristotle's logic and aristotle's logic uh, is presented, you know, in, in a modern context as categorical logic. Now, if you take the critical thinking or logic class, you get to see this categorical logic. Now, following Aristotle, the scholastics assumed that reasoning progressed by presenting the logical relations between these universals. And so, if universals don't match real things, then reasoning is about mere fictions. And so we would have no, no knowledge. So much like Aristotle and Plato, they concluded that there is a correspondence between reality and logic. And this becomes, you know, a long running battle in philosophy. Namely, does our logic and language correspond to reality or, or not? And there's all kinds of variations on these, these fights. So motivation one is, epistemic. Without universals, you have no, no knowledge. So if you want to have knowledge, you've got to accept universals. Or so they argue. And again, there are those who disagree with that. Second scholastic motivation was original sin. A good question would be, why? Well, interestingly enough, universals do help account for original sin. Uh, Odo of Tanai, which I'm probably mispronouncing, he died in uh, 1113. He claimed that humanity is a universal that all humans share. So in virtue of what are we all human? Well, the universal humanity. So how does sin work into this? Well, what he claimed was this. When the first humans 
sinned, the universal was corrupted. And since we all have this same universal, we all get the sin. To use an analogy, if you think of the universal as like a um, on a typewriter, you know, like one of the one of the strikers, you know, the thing that hits the paper. If that gets um, you know damaged, every time you you type you know H, you're going to have a, a damaged image, and so that um, would show. Again, by an analogy, how that would work. Or to use another analogy, if there's a, um, you know, a recording that has a defect in it, every time the recording is, you know, uh, recorded again and shared, you know, distributed online, for example, it's going to have that, that defect. And so the idea is that since humanity, the universal is corrupted, when we get the humanity, we get the corruption. And so universals take care of original sin, which answers, you know, a pretty tough question, which is, again, suppose Adam and Eve uh, sinned, how does that stick to everybody forever? And universals solve that problem. Third motivation for the scholastics is uh, another religious one, namely the Trinity. Now, there are various interpretations on the Trinity, and during the Middle Ages and throughout history, there have been some pretty serious fights over is there a trinity, what is the trinity, leading to all kinds of battles over heresy and orthodoxy, etc. But one of the sort of solutions to the problem of the trinity, you know, having the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is this. If you take the divine essence to be a single universal, we'll call it, you know, the God property, that solves the problem. Because you can have three entities, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that all have the same universal. They are three that are one. So that seems to provide a workaround or a solution or an explanation for the Trinity. In response to metaphysical realism about universals, there arose some dissent. And one of the early dissenters was Peter Abelard. Born in 1079, died in 1142, and is, of course, still dead today. He was a student of Rosellin and William of Champeau, and he argued against realism and nominalism in support of what is called conceptualism. So what were his attacks on realism? Well, his first attack was this. He argued that universals, if you accepted them, you'd have to accept they could have inconsistent qualities, which is a problem. For example, consider Socrates and donkey. Both of them are animals, so they instantiate the universal animal. But Socrates is rational, the donkey is irrational. So the universal animal is both rational and irrational. So, problem. Probably the most serious problem, though, is what's called the problem of multiple location. And this is a weirdness problem. So universals, whether they're transcendent or universal, are supposed to be able to exist in their entirety at different places at the same time. And again, this doesn't mean like slicing them up like slices of a pizza where you can spread them out or being like a sheet spread over multiple things. This is that the universal can exist entirely in different places at the same time, which seems impossible. And so critics of these universals see this as like fatal weirdness. Defenders of Universal say, no, this is not a problem that makes perfect sense. His final problem is the problem of pantheism. That, As we saw before, if you accept universals, you end up in pantheism. And that's, that's crazy. While Abelard rejected realism about universals, he also attacked nominalism. So how did this go? Well, he began by accepting Aristotle's definition of a universal. That a universal is, put neutrally, is what can be predicated of many things. Put informally, that is, that a universal is a property you can assign to many different individuals. An obvious example, of course, would be something like red, because there are many red things. Or, you know, being a cat, because there are many cats. Now, nominalism takes the view that universals are just you know, words. 
And he argued that universals cannot just be words for kind of a kind of weird, weird reason. This is what he said. Words are physical sounds and one physical thing cannot be predicated of another. So kind of an esoteric objection. So how did he handle universal words, given that he rejects you know, metaphysical universals? Well, he claims a universal word is just a sound, but it points to a universal concept. And the concept is the words logical content or meaning. So by means of these universal ideas, the mind, to quote him, conceives a common and confused image of many things. Hence, you know, conceptualism. For example, he says, uh, translated, of course, when I hear man, a certain figure arises in my mind, which is so related to individual men that is common to all and proper to none. Now, later thinkers really ripped into this because later critics raised the obvious thing. So what is it that you know, let's take the example of, um, you know, human. So what would be something that is common to all humans, but proper to none? Because as, you know, George Barclay, he made this argument, whenever you sort of think or of, a, of a human, you picture a particular human. You don't have like, you know, something that is common to all and proper to none. And so one objection is, against this view, is that that just doesn't, doesn't work. There can't be a thing that is, you know, common to all and proper to none. And the idea of a common and confused image, the idea would be, well, how then do you recognize it? How does that that work? Now, he does try to work out a fix to this, as do later thinkers, because you need something that ties them together. Uh, but you also want to avoid that that problem. So Abelard heads towards, on some interpretations, moderate nominalism. And on this view, what he holds is that universals are only general concepts in the mind. So they're mental constructs that do not exist beyond the mind. Now others interpret Abelard as taking steps towards what's called moderate realism. Following Aristotle, on this view, he claims that a universal concept is acquired by abstracting what is common to individuals. And there are obvious questions like, how does that work? You know, what is it that all cats have in common? How do you abstract this? And other thinkers, such as our good dead friend, George Barclay, very critical of this. But this allows, if it were to work, to have universals be objective, but also not have them exist apart from individuals. So you get your objectivity without the seeming metaphysical cost. Now, thinkers who accept this claim that universals can be considered separately from individuals using what they like to call a distinction in reason. In other words, you can't really separate them. You can just do it by reason. And some philosophers see this as kind of a cheat, including myself, because what seems to be happening is, is someone is saying, well, they're not separate entities, so there's no metaphysical cost, yet they're distinct in reason, and it does all this great work in my theory at zero cost. And that seems somewhat suspicious. Defenders of it, of course, say, well, you can make such a distinction, it's perfectly fine. Now, this view does present an alternative to metaphysical realism about universals. It denies imminent universals, but again allows objective similarities. So has some advantages. So what arises from moderate realism? Well, as noted, Abelard seems to maybe have embraced some sort of moderate realism. Uh, Thomas Aquinas later developed more, as did other people who had access to the works of Aristotle. So one way to, to take moderate realism is to accept that universal ideas exist in the mind, but also have a foundation an external reality. So what's the method here? Well, these thinkers, not surprisingly, Abelard, Aquinas, etc., are religious. So they bring in uh, God into solving this problem of universals. So initially, universals exist 
in the Latin phrase ante rem, uh, before things, in the mind of God. So to use an analogy, think of God as like, you know, a divine 3D printer. And he has the files, the, the plans for things in his mind. Next, universals exist in rem, in things, as properties that group individuals by resemblance. So going with my printer analogy, imagine that the divine printer, God, using the files in his mind, prints, you know, creates objects like cats and humans. And so what would group all humans as humans would be, to use the metaphor, we were printed from the human, you know, plan. Then universals are post-rem, after things, as mental concepts formed by abstraction. So what we do, you know, as humans, finite fallible humans, is we'd kind of try to reverse engineer the universals. You know, looking at the humans around us and trying to reconstruct in our limited, limited minds God's original plan. So in this view, the particular, the individual, would be the basic ontological entity. And the universals would exist mentally, but have you know, a very important role. Now, this view is later developed in a variety of ways, including trope theory, which happened to be a theory that I adopted and did my dissertation on. So next, we'll take a look at how trope theory can apply to time travel.